Our friend Dr. Julian Donovan writes, a bit long-winded, I'm afraid. Coach, you say that Masters athletes are volume sensitive, intensity dependent. Yes, I do say that. Looking at recent-ish literature, particularly the like summarized by Greg Knuckles, the consensus seems to be that after the novice stage and maximizing neuromuscular adaptations that progress and strength is volume dependent due to muscular size being the rate limiting step primarily for further strength, adding in the concern of sarcopenia and potential priority of increased lean mass. When, where is the place for increasing volume with regard to increasing hypertrophy, which is volume dependent in order to increase strength and combat sarcopenia more? Yeah, uh, I don't think that the literature is quite as definitive. Um, and um, I will say, as I've said many times in the past, that we are not in the anti-volume camp. We're in the optimal volume camp. Uh, we've talked about this in a ton of articles, podcasts, interviews, and videos, and I suspect uh, that our good friend Dr. Donovan was just giving me an opportunity to talk about it again. Uh, you use volume when you have to and monitor the effect not only on strength and mass but also on tendons and ligaments and sleep and soreness and recovery and adjust as necessary like any other training variable. Um, what we found is that um, if you use volume carelessly in masters, uh, it can come back to bite you. and um, and not just in terms of muscle soreness, but in terms of tendons and ligaments and sleep and so on. So we use it carefully, but we do use it. Uh, we don't use it during the novice phase. We do just fine with fives, three sets of five or five sets of three in the novice phase. But as the novice linear progression comes to an end and slowly morphs into more intermediate individualized programming, some masters will continue to make excellent progress without big increases in volume and some won't. Some will be more volume dependent and less volume sensitive than others. So when we write about masters, we're talking about the population as a whole, but there are always individual differences, especially in the masters population, which is more heterogeneous than other populations. So um, we've never been anti-volume. Uh, we've been pro-optimal volume, and I stand by everything that I've said on this topic in the past. Our dear friend Sandy Lotta asks, my question is how or when to determine chasing singles? I have a coach I trust to think for me and I'm a pretty consistent trainer following the program. Maybe I need a three, four, or six month term to fit the program into where I'm actually going to push myself to the hardest at that date. I could probably read about this in programming but I would appreciate your thoughts. Um, so uh, I'm a big fan during intermediate training of um, looking for heavy singles uh, on an intermittent basis and um, I happen to know Sandy, and uh, Sandy works very, very hard. She's incredibly strong. Um, she's way, way off the curve uh, for a lady of her demographic, her age and weight. Um, and in fact, she's looking at block programming uh, at some point in the future where she'll be, you know, she'll be looking to put up a heavy single um, every few months as part of a block program. But even without that um, that level of advancement, even early intermediates. I like to give them a time to chase heavy singles. I find that it has a lot of intangible benefits. It helps us recalibrate our program a little bit. Um, and it's a, valuable, uh, it's a valuable thing to do. Chasing singles is good. Brendan asks, if a belt provides support a la Valsalva for my spine, would my extra abdominal fat not provide the same protection to my aorta, thus preventing an aneurysm? If you don't ask, the answer is always no. <laughs> Um, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Yeah, um, right. And in this case, the answer is no, even though you did ask, right? The answer is no. In fact, um, most of the triple A's, that's abdominal aortic aneurysm to use civilians, uh, that I ever saw were in fact in fat people, uh, which made diagnosis a real barrel of laughs. Um, so clearly abdominal fat is not protective. Um, it just makes it harder for your doctor to feel that pulsatile abdominal mass that suggests that there's a monster lurking in your belly. And neither Valsalva nor lifting have anything to do with the pathogenesis of abdominal aortic aneurysm. These are uh, degenerative diseases with a very strong genetic component and associations with uh, other degenerative diseases like arteriosclerosis and tertiary syphilis. Uh, I am put in mind, however, I've got, um, I've got a couple of lectures that I did, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago on aortic catastrophes for grand rounds. I've got the video. I've been wondering if I should put those up on the Gray Steel channel. People might be interested. It's like lectures to other doctors. I don't know. What do you think? Or call it something else. What would I call it? I mean, no, I mean a, a, a different channel, maybe. I don't. I, I would. Nah. I got to put them up somewhere just to keep them. But I was thinking of putting them up on the Gray Steel channel. I mean, I don't know. You let me know. 
if you'd like to see stuff like that. Um, but uh, no, the answer is no. That's all I got. What do you think? Um, I thought it was good. Okay. Then I think we're done. <laughs> cool.